So it's a great pleasure to have uh, Professor T R Govindarajan from CMI Chennai in QSTM forum. This is the 64th QSTM seminar. Uh, last year we have managed to have 60 talks. This is the fourth talk in this year. So this is 64th QSTM seminar, and he's going to present uh, a talk on what if photon has a small mass, uh, which is based on the zero mass versus ultra, ultra light dark matter. He, he's going to address this question. And thank you TRG uh, from uh, uh, in QSTM forum. And uh, uh, thank you for your time and uh, agreeing to give this talk. And uh, you can start from your end. Okay, shall I start now? Yes. Okay. So uh, it's very nice of you to uh, ask me to speak to your friends and colleagues and students and everyone. I'm very happy to uh, be associated with your group. Uh, I'm going to talk about some work which I have done, which is uh, on the question what if photon had a small mass? And this, surprisingly, this issue I came to from a different angle, but it uh, entirely became a different question now. And uh, so I'm still working on it. And hopefully some more work can be done. And if uh, any of the students or postdocs interested in uh, uh, learning more about it and do work, I'm willing to help you out. Okay, with that as an introduction, uh, let me go to the plan of the talk. So I'm going to talk, my plan is essentially, this is some talk which I have given in few other places, including Max Planck, uh, but what I'm giving is far more than what I have given earlier, uh, because more work has been done. And uh, so this, uh, except for the initial introduction, most of it is uh, new. And uh, that is why I'm thrilled about it. And of course, even the later part I have given in one or two places, but in India, in some uh, institute, one or two institute like uh, IIT Madras, etc. But uh, what I'm giving might pose some interesting speculation and ideas which uh, some of the students may become interested. So my plan of the talk will be about uh, Schrodinger and mass of photon. And why is it I'm raising this question? You will understand once I show the slide. And uh, I will talk about how the mass of the pho photon can be introduced in a Maxwell theory, uh, which is known as the Proca theory, which will break gauge invariance. So there is a mechanism which was developed by Stuckelberg, and I will describe that part. After describing several issues in relation to Proca and Stuckelberg theory, I will talk about some issues about dark matter, which suddenly became interesting from a new angle, which I was working on. And then I will talk about Bose-Einstein condensate, which is uh, this kind of a thing and some description of both and condensate and issues in relation to that. And then I'll change my gear and uh, speculate and try to talk about something called superfluid ether or luminiferous ether. This is what people know about it. And I will talk something about it. Then I will talk about the CMB spectrum and photon mass and photon mass and lifetime. And then Stickelberg extension of standard model and then uh, summary and uh, future work. So this is going to be my plan. And I request all the students and anyone who is listening can uh, always uh, stop me and post a question. And I will try to, in this on offline mo online mode, I can only try to explain. I do not have the wherewithal to write something and then show it to you. 
but I will try to write on a paper and then show it to you in case that is required. But at the moment, uh, such the facilities are in, not in my hand right now. So I will try to use it, use only the oral remarks, which may help you to appreciate what is happening here. Okay, so why is it Schrodinger and uh, photon mass? Well, it so happened in 2018, January, I gave a talk in Dublin Institute of Advanced Studies, Dublin, and uh, the talk title I have given, must photon be massless? This is the question which I asked at that time. And uh, my question was essentially to uh, address the issue of infrared problem in QED, which people have face, and then uh, I was trying to understand that question at that time. And uh, very surprisingly, at that time, when I went through the talk, I, to my surprise, I found Erwin Schrodinger, who was a professor at Dias, same place, in uh, 1950s, 1950s. He was there from 1940 itself. He did some outstanding work there, very interestingly. And he was there till 1955 and then moved to Vienna. And then that is the way he lived. And uh, he uh, gave a talk and he gave a, presented some work which he had done with his postdoctoral fellow at that time, uh, L. Bass. And the question he asked was, must the photon must be zero? So it turned out to be an equivalent question. And my attempt to understand what forced uh, Schrodinger to ask this question uh, was uh, why is it he was asking that question. Now, um, the question, he was posing the question since massive photon, as you all know, will have three degrees of freedom, an extra degree of freedom. Whereas a massless photon uh, will have only two helicity degrees of freedom. Whereas a massive photon is spin one massive photon and uh, that will have three degrees of freedom. That is the way the representation theory of Poincare group will work out. And it makes a distinction between massive particle and massless particle and the, as an irreducible representation. And uh, this is the thing which was there. So he asked this question that if I take if I give a small mass to the photon, uh, while calculating the black body radiation, energy density, I will come to some of these issues. So this is the starting point of quantum theory itself, where Planck worked out black body radiation, energy density as a function of frequencies. And then uh, we usually multiply, we essentially consider modes of uh, vibration in a box. And then uh, after finding the energy den the densities uh, as a function of the frequencies, we multiply by a factor of two to account for the two helicity degrees of freedom. So you multiply by a factor of two. So the density of modes, rho of nu, is two h nu cube, where nu is the frequency by c square. The rest of the parameters are known to you one divided by e to the power h nu by k t minus one. This is the formula which was arrived at. And the factor two is very crucial because to arrive at Stephen's constant, we integrate this row of nu over all the, in a sphere of uh, some radius and find out the energy dissipated. From there, we try to find out what is the formula for the uh, energy dissipation. Energy dissipation is there and find that to be proportional to fourth power of t and with a constant sigma. And the sigma, the Stefan's constant can be measured experimentally. So interestingly, we have to get the correct factor of sigma, which is there. And we obtain from this formula 2h nu cube, where the factor two is very crucial. Now, if I multiply that factor by three, Obviously, the experiment and the result will not coincide. So there is a problem with that. 
if you have massive photon at that level. So this is what was bothering Schrodinger. And he asked this question, must the photon mass be zero because of this thing? So this is a picture of Erwin, a uh, statue of Erwin Schrodinger uh, in Vienna. And uh, very interestingly, uh, that formula is also written, his equation is also written down there. After 1955, he moved to uh, Vienna and lived there. And this is the statue which I saw in his place. Now, Bose versus Einstein. Now, this is a very interesting history behind it. And uh, some to give this data. Now, uh, Bose in 1924, uh, from Dhaka at that time, he wrote, he wanted to get at the Planck radiation formula by using the fact that photons are particles, light is a particles, and uh, he wanted to do the kinetic theory of gases. Inside a box, you have photon as some kind of molecules roaming around, and let me work out what are the degrees of freedom, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. This is what he wanted to do. A quantized electromagnetic radiation. Now, when he tried to work out, he introduced a very interesting input there, which became, which made him the most famous person around in that time. And that was introduced to statistics, that indistinguishability of photons as identical particles. And if they have a same state, you can't say that this photon is here, the other photon is in another place, if they have the same frequency and uh, same state, which is describing that. And uh, that Bose, what was called later called Bose statistics, he introduced in that paper and he tried to publish it. When he worked out the thing, he wrote down the paper and again, he multiplied by a factor of two, okay? He multiplied by the factor of two and uh, he called that that is a spin of the particle has two degrees of freedom and Bose introduced a factor of two, but he called it a spin one. He called it a spin one, something like spin one. And very interestingly, he <coughs> said that uh, this is the thing here. Now, should we multiply by three? So this is what the thing by Einstein, unfortunately he could not publish that paper because many other journals refused to accept it. So he was uh, desperate. So he wrote a letter to Albert Einstein around that time and sought his help in getting it published if he is convinced that the work is good. And once Einstein saw the paper, he was actually completely satisfied that's a fantastic work and he decided to help uh, Bose. So translated and it was published in Annalander Physik, a German journal. He published it, got it published in uh, this uh, German uh, uh, science journal, physics journal at that time. And he made a correction there. And that correction was that Multiplying by a factor of two, he accepted, but he wanted to remove the name spin of the particle. Okay, he want he called it as helicity or uh, at that time polarization of photon. He called it as polarization of photon, which is electromagnetic wave concept. Electromagnetic wave, the elect photon, the light tra is traveling as a wave in a particular direction. The wave is transversal and it is electric field and magnetic field are perpendicular to the direction of the motion and they have two, two directions perpendicular to that which contribute to the two polarizations in an electromagnetic theory of Maxwell's theory. So we multiplied by the factor of two and called it polarizations instead of spin. This is what was a correction made by Einstein. At that time, we will come to that very interesting. But Bose was slightly unhappy about it, but he could not do anything because if you call it as a particle, 
particle can have spin, electron has spin, and other particles have spin. Now you don't say that helicity or polarization for the particle. That is what was bothering him. But he went with the correction to multiply by the factor of two because the two is very crucial in getting Stefan's constant. <coughs> this is what was the issue about it. So the three is additional longitudinal degree of freedom is the crucial one, which was there. And in addition to transverse degree of freedom. So the longitudinal degree of freedom, which can be very small, and that is what was bothering him at that time. So this is what was the issue about it. Now the question is, should we multiply by factor of three? So this answer was given by Schrodinger himself, because what is required is uh, to obtain the correct black body radiation formula, uh, to obtain the correct black body radiation formula, uh, what is required is how the photon or the electron photon is coupled to the walls of the box in which you are, uh, you are con considering the black body. The black body being a box and uh, nothing goes in and the radiation is controlled completely inside and they come to an equilibrium by interaction with the wall getting reflected by the wall and it comes to equilibrium. This is what is happening. Now, uh, if the answer was, if the vector potential in mu, which describes the photon, even though it is spin, the mass is there instead of masslessness, if it is coupled to a conserved current like J mu, A mu, there is a current J mu and the interaction between the current and the potential is J mu, A mu and the J mu is conserved, D mu J mu is zero. If that happens, then we should not multiply by the factor of three, but one should multiply by a factor of two. If the mass of the photon is very, very tiny, very small, the additional contribution is so small that you don't have to bother about it. Essentially longitudinal photons do not interact with the walls and it is only the transverse photons which interact with the walls and get equilibrium and that is what is playing the role in black body radiation. This is what was given by uh, uh, Schrodinger in his famous paper which I gave the reference and this is the idea about it. Okay, now, uh, so the question is, then he went ahead now, assuming it to be a factor of three, uh, spin uh, mass is there, very tiny mass. He wanted to put a limit on the mass of the photon by experiment. We have to experimentally find out. I will describe some of these things later, but for the moment, I will go through what he did, what Schrodinger did. So you should multiply by the factor of two instead of three, that is fine, but we can estimate the bound on the mass of the photon. So, what he did was to estimate it. The massive photon, like any other case, obeys an equation which is one. It is d'Alembertian square minus m gamma square vector potential A is equal to mu naught times the current J. This is what is the equation it will obey. These equations are very easy to get given the Maxwell's equation along with an extra term, which is uh, A mu A mu, which is there, you can easily work it out. Now, the solution for this is also very simple. Uh, we know how to solve del square minus m square phi is equal to some rho, that equation. We have to essentially do the same equation, which is there. And that A, which is there, is given by the vector potential solution is essentially given by mu naught by four pi del cross m hat m vector, that m vector which I'm writing is not related to ma mass of the mono, uh, dip or the mass of the photon, m gamma is mass of the photon, and this is a dipole moment of whatever object which is there, and then e to the power minus, because j will create a magnetic field which is going to come from a magnetic dipole moment, 
and e to the power minus m gamma r by r. This is what is the formula for that. If it turns out, if it turns out m gamma is zero, then you would have got one by r, and this is what we would have actually used in a conventional theory. So since the mass is there, it is e to the power minus m gamma r divided by r. and this is the formula for that so once this a is there equation 2 i can work out the magnetic field the magnetic field is b is equal to uh, that m the magnetic moment mass of the, of the magnetic moment which is there i should have put a vector sign because b is also vector but at the moment i am not doing that i am only considering the magnitude of that e power minus m gamma r r divided by r cube because the magnetic field due to dipole will go like 1 by r cube uh, so there is some uh, typo there it is e power minus m gamma r by r cube there is no r there 1 plus m gamma r plus m 1/3 m gamma r square r square 3z r hat r hat minus z hat so that 3z hat r hat r hat Minus that at is actually the Legendre polynomial uh, P two which you have, which is the conventional one. For example, if you put m gamma is equal to zero in three, you will have only the P two part or y two m, y two zero if you want. That is what will be there, and that is what is the conventional formula modified with the mass of the photon. Now we can compare. With the magnetic field when m gamma is equal to 0 which is what i have written down m divided by r cube and whatever is that in that bracket there is a typo in equation 3 again that r outside the bracket is not required that's outside sorry okay so in the observed so what he did was consider the earth as a magnet and he wanted to find use the data which is available about the magnetic field of earth on the surface of the earth and slightly away from the surface of the earth so if it is made on the surface of the sphere with the dipole at the center okay we can substitute r is equal to capital r which is the radius of the earth the effective magnetic moment will get an extra factor which is 1 plus m gamma r plus 1/3 m gamma r whole back this is what is that bracketed term which is there that is some you could have actually pulled it out and kept with that thing the last term is extra which reduces the field you can see that equation 3 the last term m gamma square r, r square is it hat it reduces the field because it has a minus sign in front of it so the magnetic field is reduced if m gamma is not equal to 0 if m gamma is 0 that is fine the conventional thing so what he did was essentially compare the magnetic uh, field assuming m gamma and in relation to b0 at the equator and find found out what is that extra term which is there that extra factor is 2/3 m gamma r square which is what is equation 3 last term is giving you and then followed by the denominator which is there which is coming from this 1 plus m gamma r plus 1/3 m gamma r square r square so this is the simple calculation which compares the magnetic field which would have been there if m mass is not zero if m is zero then uh, then you will get the answer is 1 this relation ratio phi is 1 that's what you are going to get uh, appropriately with some factors there okay this is what is there in this thing here showing it used one the earth based measurement data he obtained the ratio to be 539 by 31089 which is from the data which was available at that time and he pro provided mass of the photon should be less than some number which he given in terms of the length this is the compton wavelength of the photon now uh satellite data are also available and improves the limit by another order which i will explain what is happening and i will explain what is the limit which he got considering the earth as a magnet we can estimate the mass of the photon using the above formula and comparing with data 
the magnetic field has an extra non-potential contribution, which is not like the term like uh, what you have here as the Legendre polynomials ago, and which depends on the mass of the photon, m gamma square. It has a negative contribution. This can be compared and gave the mass to be less than 10 to the power minus 47 grams. This is what I will explain that in elect uh, electron volt shortly. By careful analysis, Goldhaber and Miato in 1971, with better data, improved it to 10 power minus 48 gram. This is what he obtained. Okay, this is what they obtained. Schrodinger's estimates based on geomagnetic surveys are still very good. So it's very clear he got 10 power minus 47 as a limit, upper limit, whereas now it is improved to 10 power minus 48, only one order of magnitude after 20 years. And it is still staying at that level to less than 10 power minus 48 from whatever magnetic field we can get it. But we can do the calculations for the galactic magnetic field. And some people have done that thing and found the estimate to be 10 power minus 56 grams. But there are a lot of questions because we don't know exactly the magnetic field at the edge of the galaxies, etc., and other issues. So this 10 power minus 56 is not there in particle data book as such. And it is less than 10 power minus 48 is there, but it is mentioned that this is also something and it is in uh, question mark, with question mark. This is what is there. Compton wavelength of this is actually correspond to radius of the solar system. If you take it as 10 power minus 48, if you take it as 10 power minus 56, it turns out to be galactic sizes. This is what is the thing. So it is like one parsec or something like a few parsecs, three or four parsecs for the Compton wavelength. And if you want the numbers in terms of electron volt, it is 10 power minus 16 electron volt. It is less than that. And it is very tiny. If you want to know, compare the due to know which we are now trying to give a mass, find the mass is expected to be something on the order of one electron volt or 0.1 electron volt kind of this thing. So this is 16 orders less than that. That is what is the mass of the particle. It's extremely tiny. And the tiniest thing is the thing. But this is the Compton wavelength is, uh, if you do that, this is what is go going to be size of the galaxy or size of the solar system. This is what is the Compton wavelength. Now I can ask the question, okay, let me try to do better and better experiments and how far we can experimentally verify what is the mass of the photon. Can you actually find it to be exactly zero is the question. Answer is you cannot. There is no thought experiment. Even Gadakan experiment is not possible to verify that the mass of the experiment, uh, photon to be exactly zero. What you will always find it to be is less than some value like 10 power minus 16 goes to 10 power minus 20 or 10 power minus 22 or 10 power minus. But size of the universe provides a cutoff from Hubble constant, etc., which provides a limit like 10 power minus 33 electron volt. So we can say that it is less than 10 power minus 33 uh, because whatever experiment we do, we will be essentially constrained within the universe. And this is the best we can say experimentally as of now from all these cosmological kind of experiments. And uh, given that we may actually find that photon has a small mass and it is greater than some value. It may be something like greater than 10 power minus 30 electron volt. So then it actually has a mass. That's what is the problem. So this is what is the thing at all. There are laboratory experiments which has been done after that. So what happens is the wavelength is independent, independence of light, velocity of light is one of the direct consequences of photon mass being zero. The wavelength does not depend on the velocity of light. But if it is, this is coming from the fact that E square is equal to P square C square plus M, M naught square C power four. This is what is there, relation energy between mass and uh, momentum. And that when 
when you have mass is zero, then it will make energy is equal to P and that is what is essentially going to give you the wavelength independence of light with the velocity of light. That is what is the uh, velocity at that time. Now the velocity of the light, if it has a mass with different frequencies, it will have different velocities. And uh, so you have to accommodate that kind of a thing. So you can try to do cosmo astrophysical experiments from looking at various things and provide a limit on what is the mass of the photon from whatever experiments which we can do, like uh, gamma ray bursts, et cetera, et cetera. And there are a lot of uncertainties about it because we don't know what is happening between the source of the gamma ray bursts and here in terms of that. And there are these uncertainties provide a limit that mass of pro photon is less than 10 power minus 42 grams, which is not as good as what Schrodinger himself obtained. Astronomical level estimate, which we did earlier, which explained earlier, is slightly better. There are several other estimates with a lot of uncertainties, and the best so far uh, can be essentially 10 power minus 18 electron volt. Or if you have galactic magnetic field, if you do a better estimate, it would be less than 10 power minus 24. This is the status of the mass of the photon. Now, the question is theory, theory what theory, is it you are going to do? TRG, in the yes. light, uh, you have mentioned yes. about the astronomical measurement. So what kind yeah. of astronomical estimates people have done? No, this is what is a thing with here, which is balloon experiment here. Well, essentially, I earth-based experiment. It's essentially earth-based experiment. And the other cosmological, the galactic measurement, that assuming that there is a magnetic field at the end of the galaxy, and uh, some of the movement of the galactic stars are due to the magnetic fields at the, from the center. Uh, people have estimated the thing and there is still doubt about it. So the astronomical one is the Earth-based magnetic thing is the, so far the best. And uh, people, so the current, current particle data book gives only 10 power minus 18 electron volt as the experimental limit. 10 power minus 24 comes from cosmology, essentially galaxy. So okay. assuming something about the galaxy and also this thing. The next experiments are only how the gamma ray burst, gamma rays reaching us will show the differences. Now, even the recent uh, LIGO experiments, uh, they show don't give anything better than this kind of an estimate because we observe the gravitational wave as well as the photon, the electromagnetic thing, and uh, both seem to have arrived at the same time with a short difference, few seconds, uh, over a distance of uh, several uh, light years, thousands of light years, millions of light years. So this is the current status. As of now, this is the current status. The 10 power minus 18 electron volt, it is less than that. This is the current status of the experiments. Okay. Now, I'm going to ta talk about the theory. How do I introduce the mass? So the mass is introduced as we know electromagnetic theory and described by vector field, vector potential A mu. So you add a term which is called M square A mu A mu. So that theory is called Proca theory. Now, if you add m square a mu a mu, uh, it describes a spin one particle with three degrees of freedom, no doubt about it, free theory. Whereas the Maxwell theory has only two degrees of freedom, two polarizations. That is because the Maxwell theory has gauge invariance, okay? It has gauge invariance. So it reduces the four, the vector potential, four components it reduces the degree of freedom to two transverse component alone. And the longitudinal and time like components uh, are constraints. They are gauge constraints. They are removed by the gauge degree of freedom. So this is what happens when Proca theory is considered as well as Maxwell theory is considered. So now what happens is obvious. If it has a mass, it has three degrees of freedom. If the mass is zero, 
it has two degrees of freedom. So there is a discontinuity in the degrees of freedom when we take m gamma to zero. This is the problem with that. But actually you can consider the theory as QED, massive QED, as I told you, I can couple massive that m squared a mu a mu. And in addition, I can consider psi mass d slash psi plus mass of the electron, which I call massive QED. It is not conventional QED, but massive QED. And it is renormalizable. There is no problem with the renormalizability of the theory itself. Okay, so massive QED is renormalizable. There are no problem with ultra, ultra, at the ultraviolet. And uh, if you make the mass to be tiny, but non-zero, uh, we will find the contribution of the longitudinal photon to several processes are extremely small. If M gamma is very tiny, any quant QED process which you consider, like E plus E minus going to something like E plus E minus, E, E scat, electron, electron scattering, electron protons, and whatever calculation you have been doing, if you do with the passive QED, with this mass term, you will find the difference is so small that experimentally you don't find it new thing here. And very interestingly, there is a conventionally, there is a problem there is a problem with the QED, which is due to the mass being zero. Because the mass is zero in a fort loop integral, where you will have d4k divided by k square will come, which is due to the propagator. Now, when k square is zero, okay, because the loop integral will be zero to infinity or minus infinity to plus infinity. So because of that thing, when it is zero, it is divergent. This divergence is known as infrared divergence and because the mass is zero. If mass is not zero, but small, there is no divergence at the infrared. So it's completely finite. There is no problem. M gamma being zero uh, and M gamma is not equal to zero are two different things in the conventional QED. They resolved this problem. Infrared QE uh, problem is resolved earlier in 1960s and early 1970s by considering what is known as the electron, which you consider is really not electron at free electron at infinity. Asymptotically, that is not possible because it is always accompanied, it is always accompanied by soft photons, photons which have very, very, very long wavelength. So there is a cloud of soft photons always attached to the electron and we can never consider asymptotically free electron. But our scattering theory assumes at asymptotically free electron, asymptotically free photon, and that is why this thing is considered. But so they resolve that problem in that fashion by considering this thing and assuming that your experiment has a limit when you try to measure the, photo, the scattering that there is some experimental error that you cannot have uh, uh, less than, you cannot measure something less than that. And it can be soft photons of that kind can be attached to the electron, which can make the change. So this way they actually did very interesting calculation and that was resolved theoretically by Fadi and Kulish in 1970, where they considered asymptotically it is not electron, asymptotically electron along with a cloud of soft photons, which is a coherent state of soft photons, is to be attached to the electron. And this is the asymptotic state which you have to take when you consider scattering theory. This is what is the thing. But the crucial problem still remains, which is, the gauge invariance is not obeyed here. But gauge invariance played a major role in all the Hello. later theories. And the Stuckelberg, yes? Uh, sir, so I have a very time. naive question. So yes. like uh, in the Maxwell theory, uh, we have four degrees of freedom initially. We fix one of them yes. by saying the mass is zero and the other one is fixed by picking up a gauge, right? Choosing yeah. a gauge. Yeah. So like uh, since in the gauge, the gauge invariance, hmm. yeah. So since the gauge invariance is not respected in this theory, is it still okay to fix one, one degree of freedom that no, way? No, no, you cannot fix it. You cannot fix it. There are three degrees of freedom in this theory with M is not zero, but 
the computation of massive QED, the difference, so it will give a different result. There is no doubt. QED and massive QED will give a different result for any process. But that process, the difference is on the order of M gamma square. If M gamma square is very small, the difference is not experimentally, you cannot find it. That's the result. Okay. So there is no experiment which will distinguish to the extent we know now. If you know the distinction, then we can experimentally verify. And uh, the limit which you have given earlier, we can improve on it and give a better limit. But we are not in that state at all. So now I'm going to talk about the gauge invariance. Stuckelberg actually did a very clever thing. In fact, he was a precursor to finding spontaneous symmetry breakdown and mass of Higgs mechanism itself. He was a precursor to find it. And he did that at least some 10, 10 or 15 years before uh, Higgs mechanism came. And very interesting. And uh, Stuckelberg theory is next one. So what he did was he wanted to, what he did was he considered uh, electromagnetic theory, which is uh, a mu. He introduced a scalar field phi. He introduced a scalar field phi. So the Lagrangian for that, you can forget the QED part, which is the fermion part at the end. You take only minus one fourth F mu mu square plus M square A mu minus one by M D mu phi whole square. Now, this Lagrangian six is invariant under gauge transformation, A mu going to A mu minus B mu lambda and phi going to phi plus M lambda. If you make that six is invariant. So this theory six, like describing by six is gauge invariant theory. Local gauge invariance is there. And uh, how many degrees of freedom? There is A mu, which is four degrees of freedom to start with. And another field, which is phi, which, is, uh, which, is, which makes it five degrees of freedom, A mu on phi, okay? Now there is a gauge invariance, which reduces the degrees of freedom by two units. In the conventional theory, A mu going to the transverse degrees of freedom, it reduces, gauge degree of freedom reduces by two degrees of freedom, cuts down two degrees of freedom. And now five degrees of freedom will cut down to three degrees of freedom. That's what will happen, okay? Now this theory six, which is there, is the Stuckelberg theory. Now you can see that there is no discontinuity in the degrees of freedom because if M square goes to zero, you have two degrees of freedom coming from F mu nu square and one degree of freedom from D mu phi whole square, which is a thing, which is completely decoupled. It is decoupled scalar field, which is what is there. So there is a three degrees of freedom and three degrees of freedom are together when M is not zero and three degrees of freedom are decoupled to two plus one when M goes to zero. That's what happens with this theory, okay? So given that Stuckelberg theory, this is what the thing, this is Stuckelberg QED. If you want, you can consider this as Stuckelberg QED. This is what is the result of that. Now, okay, this is what is the thing. Now, Higgs mechanism is also another way of giving mass to the photon. You can give mass to the photon by Higgs mechanism also. For that, what will you do? You will introduce a complex scalar field because the vector field should interact. Maxwell field should interact with the complex scalar field because it needs charge. And then you can consider equation eight, which is the Lagrangian for the complex scalar field interacting with the uh, AMU field. Now you go to the V of phi potential is such that it is spontaneously broken. Phi square is R square in some phase, okay? So you expand around it, phi is equal to R e power I phi, and then substitute in equation eight, you will find the electromagnetic field picks up a mass. That phi field, which is the phase, which I have, not the capital phi, but the phase factor e power I phi, that is actually the Stickelberg field in the previous page, which I wrote to you. Now, if you take this theory eight and make the mass of 
R, the Higgs field to be infinity are very, very, very large. So that the fluctuations of R are very small. Then the gauge boson, so it will decouple. That fluctuations of R and think then it will decouple, it will not interact and we can ignore it. And what will be there is exactly the Stuckelberg theory. This is what is a Stuckelberg theory is a limit of eight with the mass of R, the uh, Higgs field going to infinity, but the gauge boson mass remains finite. This is the limit. It is a particular limit of complex scalar. That's why I say that uh, Stuckelberg is the precursor for Higgs mechanism itself. There is another way to introduce mass. That is introducing what is called two form field, B mu nu, which is called Carl Bramon field. So you consider the two form, B mu nu, Bx mu, Dx mu, B field, and its gauge field, uh, B, and field strength is the exterior derivative of the gauge B field. Okay, you know about exterior derivative? And I assume if you know, if you don't know, you ask me right now. So it is essentially like D mu nu minus D nu nu. You have to find out anti-symmetric combination of D rho B mu nu in all possible ways and write down the field strength. This field B mu nu conventionally describe a spin one particle after elimination of constraints. There are a lot of constraints in this theory also. So the theory is what we have is H wedge H star plus M square B square. Okay, this is what is the theory for the B mu nu field. Now, this theory is spin one degree of freedom. Very interestingly, it has spin one degree of freedom. And you can take it as equation of motion and find out that it is describing spin one degree of freedom, which is very simple to find out. But if you take M going to zero limit of this equation, Lagrangian, then you have a zero degree of freedom, spin zero particle, massless zero particle. Now this is what is this theory is going to describe. Again, the theory has uh, the B mu nu field with mass and without mass, uh, there is a discontinuity in the degrees of freedom, just like massive Proca theory and Maxwell theory. What, what is the discontinuity? Six degree of freedom, it has three degrees of freedom, and when it goes to zero mass, it becomes a spin zero particle. That is what, there's only one direction which is there and spin zero particle. Now what I'm going to do is an interesting interaction between this B mu nu field and A mu field. That is described by equation nine. This F wedge F star is simply F mu nu, F mu nu, okay? And then H wedge H star is essentially h mu nu rho, h mu nu rho. That is what is the next thing. Now I can interact the b mu nu field with f mu nu, b mu nu f rho, f mu, uh, f rho sigma. And that is what I have here in this part, b wedge f, okay? Or b wedge f is essentially epsilon mu nu rho sigma, b mu nu f rho sigma. That is what in, explicit notation is going to be given by that. And very interestingly, that equation nine is also gauge invariant because that gauge transformation which you do in B will be compensated. It's only a total divergent term which will be produced. And that mass M term, which is there, is becomes a mass of the photon. Mass of the photon. You can convert this whole problem into a mass of the photon theory where the two degrees of freedom for M mu will come along with the spin zero particle, which is M is equal to zero, along with the spin zero thing, it will pick up the mass. And that is what this theory is going to be. It's like uh, topologically massive gauge theory. This is the name for it, which is there. So the combined gauge transformations leave the gauge invariant Lagrangian total divergent invariant. This is what is the thing here. We can do the same thing in three dimensions. I will not bother too much about it. And the equation 10, Lagrangian, describes two plus one Maxwell Chern Simons theory. And that is what is it. Now I can extend this thing, the Stuckelberg mechanism, 
to supersymmetric theory also. Supersymmetric theory for QED was already done. Now, Stuckelberg QED is there, which we have given. Now, you can have a SUSE Stuckelberg QED. And you can ask a question what will happen there. And very interestingly, it will be described by a n is equal to 1 supersymmetric QED is described by a vector multiplet, uh, two chiral multiplets, uh, L plus, L minus, that 5 plus, 5 minus, this thing. And uh, a matter of path, matter of path which, which is there coming from the mass term, etc. I will write down all the terms which are there. The, these are all standard things in supersymmetric QED. Even if you don't know, don't bother about it. This is only to tell you that you can do a supersymmetric extension of Stuckelberg mechanism for the theory. And that is what equation 12 is going to give you. Now I can, this is actually QED as of now. I am going to introduce the gauge transformation is what I have written down in super field language, B going to be plus I lambda minus lambda dagger, phi plus minus going to e power plus or minus two I Q. Q is the charge lambda for phi plus minus. And these are all invariant under this. The Stuckelberg theory is you introduce another field S, yes, which is a Stuckelberg field. And so that it cancels that V going to V plus I lambda minus lambda dagger is canceled by S going to S minus M lambda. This is exactly similar to what we did here uh, in this thing, equation seven, that super, the AMU transformation is canceled by phi transformation. And that precisely is generated here in this form here, equation 13. The net result of the mechanism is a theory is in for our safe photon, Stuckelberg field, and the super partners. Now the limit which you'll get finally, if you're going to do QED theory with proper limit taken by quantized by Fundy and Kulish. This is what is the thing. For very small mass of the longitudinal photon, Stickelberg field interact very little with matter and hence does not affect the experiments known so far. And in fact, they provide the limit for, for the photon mass. This is what is the thing. Now there is an interesting discussion about longitudinal photons in the paper of Schrodinger himself that extra degree of freedom will have some effects in certain questions. Mass and Schrodinger analyzed this question in relation to black body radiation. They pointed out that approach to equilibrium of longitudinal photon in a cavity is very, very slow with time scale comparable to the age of the universe. So it does never gets uh, equilibrated. So it essentially goes away. All the longitudinal photons play no role in energy loss because the production of longitudinal photon is also rate is very, very small. And they estimated a nucleus emitting X-rays will emit longitudinal X-rays with probability M gamma by omega whole square. And it is very, very tiny. It doesn't, you don't find it emits longitudinal photons in this way. Hence, even with the highest densities, or large time scales like the age of the universe, these photons will have negligible effect is the conclusion Bass and Schrodinger arrived at. So what now? Stuckelberg field does not interact with matter, period. In a Compton length of scale of one by M, this is like few parsecs, okay? We don't know what is the mass. So if it is less than 10 power minus 18, it is great, the length, Compton length is greater than the solar radius. If it is 10 power minus 25, it is galactic, galactic length scales. This is the kind of a thing which will be there for the problem here, okay? Now, can it do something is a question. So it doesn't give you anything, it doesn't affect, if you do this, if you introduce the mass, it is consistent theory. It does not affect any experimental result and you can actually go home after that. You will not find it. But there is a new thing that is there. 
it has energy and it has a small mass however small it has a mass and the mass will gravitate it will have gravitational interaction in the mass is gravitational interaction can it contribute to dark matter is a question now what is dark matter is what i'm going to explain here next one okay can it explain dark matter what the hell is dark matter and it is amusing to call light as dark matter the third component of light as dark matter is very interesting way of looking at it what is dark matter our universe consists of mass matter dark matter and dark energy the total contribution of matter is only 5% and 20% comes from dark matter and 75% comes from dark energy so what you see by way of stars galaxies and various other objects which you can see by optical or electromagnetic and other things is only 5% including neutrinos including neutrinos this is only 5% the rest of them are 20% dark matter and 75% we don't even know what we know is only 5% but if you have a galaxy you can ask the question what is the speed of a distant star in the galaxy now it is the galaxies are rotating about the center because there is a central huge black hole uh, which is there about which these things seem to rotate and we can ask a person with what velocity they are all rotating in the spiral galaxy of milky way etc etc and they also contribute for gravitational lensing and acceleration of the universe you can find it now when you do that like our kepler's law you will find that your uh, the speed should go down like the curve which i have drawn a the curve which i have drawn is a is what you would expect like a plus second law the rotation velocities will decrease with distance from the center but what you see experimentally is b it remains almost flat for a large distance almost to the end of the thing it remains uh, flat and why is it happening because there is probably a lot of mass in between and which is pulling the which is providing the gravitational pull and making the curve to go like b instead of a and that is a proposal for the dark matter okay so this is one of the things galaxy clusters mass distributions can be measured in couple of independent ways the radial velocities within the clusters x rays from the cluster spectrum and flux give detailed estimate of the temperature pressure leading to the mass profile of the clusters gravitational lensing of distant galaxies measures the cluster without the need for velocities all these things point to dark matter which is phi is to 1 the dark matter is phi times the uh, real matter which we have this is the 5% and 25% 20% which i mentioned to you earlier though dark matter unusual matter which we know like baryons etc or matter they don't evolve in the same way from the big bang dark matter does not interact with matter and radiation and affects the cmb cosmic microwave background radiation in a big way and it gives you a differential evolution and dark matter is crucial for formation of the galaxy itself it should keep the stars within the galactic side so the galaxy formation the dark matter plays a crucial role and several candidates have been proposed for the dark matter now there are supersymmetric theories grand unified supersymmetric theories etc extra dimensions higgs etc they provide some candidates which we don't know and uh, sterile neutrinos provide another candidate again there is a problem there are problems okay and primordial black holes massive compact objects are modified you can modify the theory of gravity at galactic scale etc etc okay so light bosons from qcd axions and axion like particles fuzzy cold dark bosons these are all various ways in which some solution for dark matter has been given it is still an open problem we don't know what is dark matter so if any student is interested they can actually look into this thing by this example now fuzzy dark matter involves that is what i am going to focus 
which is called ultralight particles having Compton wavelength and cosmological scales with mass comparable in order of magnitude. It is like something like 10 power minus 20 electron volt. So in uh, Compton wavelengths thing, it should be something like uh, thousand uh, parsecs or even million parsec or 100,000 parsec. This is the kind of thing which will be there. Okay, so this is the thing. And we saw Tickleberg field decouples at very, at, from physical processes and it has only gravitational interaction and has mass in this range and it can play this role. That is what is the thing here. If the mass of the candidate is too small, they will travel very close to the velocity of light. We know that neutrinos travel very close to the velocity of light. So at the Big Bang, they will all decouple very early. They will not be there at all. So it will not help in galactic formation if this is the case, is one of the objections that can be there. And the interesting thing is that is where Bose, which I mentioned, mentioned earlier, and Einstein held. Remember, Bose's paper through Einstein and followed by Einstein. Remember, I mentioned that Bose mentioned spin degree of freedom, but took it as two degrees of freedom. But later people found the photon has spin one particle. And uh, it in all angular momentum conservation, you have to use spin one for the photon. The polarization is two degrees of freedom, two polarizations, which is the helicity, which is what we described. Now what was done by Bose and Einstein, he was very impressed by that work of Bose. Later, Einstein himself wrote the paper about, he applied both statistics to ideal gas. He applied it to ideal gas uh, in statistical mechanics now. And ideal gas in statistical mechanics, he found a new state of matter, which is called Bose-Einstein condensate. <laughs> what happens is because the statistics all the Bose particles can go to the ground state, their tendency will go to the ground state. So that is what will happen. And the temperature will push it up, go to give them, excite them to higher and higher energies. So there exists a critical temperature below which the Bose Einstein condensate will remain as condensate and the rest of them will be the conventional statistical degrees of freedom, which will be there for any ideal gas. That depends on the mass of the particle which you have here. So this is the picture of Bose and Einstein. And what happens is very interestingly, in the fuzzy dark matter picture, we may treat the constituent particles as these Tickleberg particles, which do not interact. This particle will be such candidate only if they form a Bose-Einstein condensate. Formation of bose einstein condensate requires two conditions. There should be a conservation law particle number. There should be a constant density for the part gas. And secondly, there should be a critical temperature below which, below which the system should exist, critical temperature. The critical temperature is given by equation 14, where the density of particles and the mass of photon come into the picture there. Mass of the particle, if you want to say that. So where have they found Bose-Einstein condensate? They have done experiment for ideal Bose gas and the experiments were done using rubidium-87. Rubidium-87 has mass 86 GeV. 86 GeV is 86 into 10 power nine electron volt. Remember that. Whereas we are talking about particles, which is 10 power minus 20 electron volts. These particles, the rubidium 87, so they go to very, very low temperatures, nano Kelvin, something like 10 power minus nine degrees Kelvin. At that low temperature, because the critical temperature, which I have given here in 14, turns out to be if mass is 10 power uh, this uh, nine, G, uh, 10 power nine electron volt, the critical temperature turns out to be nano Kelvin. If the mass is very tiny, the critical temperature will go up. 
and the Stickelberg particles have mass 10 power minus 20 electron volt. So you can ask the question, what is the critical temperature at which the bosons and condensate will be formed? The critical temperature will, if you apply this formula, it will turn out to be 10 to the power, something like 22 uh, degrees Kelvin, which is very close to, which is in fact greater than even Big Bang temperature. So the critical temperature which you have you required is so large that the photons, the longitudinal photons, which are there, which if before the radiation level era, before the radiation era starts, which is one second after the Big Bang, before that, much before, much, much before that, you will form condensates formed and remain as condensate always till now. So it can be a serve as a dark matter candidate. So dark matter evolution is also something which we should take into account. So Friedman expansion is what is required after the radiation era, which is starting. So the radiation era, the time factor is T to the power half, T to the power 23, E power HT. These are the formulas for the epochs which you have, radiation era, matter era, dark energy era. If you apply that formula to this expansion, to what is the uh, critical density to start with, if you assume the current, uh, current row final is exactly the uh, density of dark matter, then we can find out what should be rho naught one power three. That is what is the thing here. So this is a standard picture, which is there for Big Bang and afterwards. And this is the expansion. I'm not going to explain this, okay? So employing this, we get the relation between observed dark matter density rho, critical temperature required to obtain rho sanction condensation as 10 power minus 22 m gamma Tc cubed. The 10 power minus m22 is used because the current dark matter density is 10 power minus 22 kilograms per cubic meter, or you can say it is one proton per cc, okay, is the value. Now, if you take the M gamma to be 10 power minus 19 electron volt, critical temperature will turn out to be 10 power 17 degrees Kelvin. If you take it to be 10 power minus 22 electron volt, the critical temperature will be 10 power 19 K. If you take it to be 10 power minus 24, another or 25, then it will be 10 power 20 Kelvin. This is what is the critical temperature. So our universe has always been at a temperature less than this temperature. So if it is formed at that time, it will remain as a condensate for all the evolution which we have done so far. Current temperature for the universe is 2.7 degrees Kelvin. This is what is the current temperature. The condensate, once it is formed at earlier times, will remain so for all times. This is what is the thing here. Now, there could be more than one source. I'm not, I'm ignoring all that part here. Now, the dark matter and BEC, you have assumed the current dark matter density can be entirely explained in terms of that. The Thing is, consider treatment of dark matter as a relativistic scalar field. A tiny mass term breaks a shift invariance. There is an invariant shift invariance, and that is the mechanism which provides the uh, BEC and conserved quantity. And non relativistic fluid, the BEC can be treated as a non relativistic fluid, even though the particles are relativistic particles. The whole object, you cannot treat them as particles. We should treat them as fluid existing throughout our solar system or throughout our galaxy in some way as a fluid. That is the whole idea about this. Now, what I'm going to explain briefly what has been done. So what is called half radius of condensates. The condensate is a huge object. Uh, it's a fluid. We can find out the density profile and how, where it is having half the radius, half the mass, the radius of that, and their masses, et cetera. So this is essentially, you take the FRW metric, uh, Friedman, Robertson, Lamaitar, 
Walker matrix and substitute e to the power i m c square t by times i because it is non-relativistic condensate. And the potential V, which is there in 17, is going to be Poisson equation in 18. So what you have to do is uh, that rho, which is there is psi dagger psi, which is the density of the particles themselves, and substitute that in equation 17. And then that's a nonlinear equation to try to solve that. I'm not going to explain all those details, the theoretical model of this thing, and uh, people have done a lot of work on this. I, we have also started working on some of these issues. And with some of the interesting thing is the half radius. There's a very interesting paper by Witten, very interestingly, by Hui, Ostricker, Tremain, and Witten, who have explained using a scalar particle, they don't assume any particular candidate for that, whereas we are assuming this uh, Stuckelmer particle and they obtain, which we can directly evolve and use it to obtain a parameter space for our problem. Dwarf galaxy is one place where fuzzy dark matter has strength in explaining. And uh, I will probably avoid this thing, which is purely astrophysical thing, unless somebody wants to know about it. I will just skip this part. So this is the thing. Now I'm going to, uh, the same arguments are used for ultralight axions, but we don't know anything axions. And massive photon, it is already, as a mass, it is there. And it can serve as a candidate for the uh, dark matter. This is basically the idea. Now, I'm going to change gear. As I told you, this mass, extremely tiny particle, which does not interact with matter at all, OK? It exists as a fluid at a galactic scale. In the whole solar system, it exists as a wave, OK, as a fluid. But the mass of the quanta is 10 to the power minus, say, 22 electron volts. This is what is the thing which is there. Now I'm going to change gear and speculate a little more. Einstein's special theory of relativity and michelson morley experiment established the irrelevance of ether medium for propagation of light. We know that ether is not required for propagation of light because the quanta will travel by itself without need for any medium. Einstein gave a very interesting talk uh, after his work in general relativity in 1915. He gave the general theory of relativity in 1915, and he gave a very interesting talk in 1922 that is published in a booklet which is called Sidelights on Relativity. And I will quote from his remark. To deny the ether is ultimately to uh, deny ether is ultimately to assume empty space has no physical qualities whatsoever. That means the space has no physical qualities. The fundamental facts of mechanics do not harmonize with this view. Mechanics requires some property for the empty space also. That is what we call as vacuum. Recapitulating, we may say that according to general relativity, the space is endowed with physical qualities. Even the space is endowed with physical mechanical properties. In this sense, there exists an ether. According to the general theory of relativity, space without ether is unthinkable. This is what Einstein himself saying, okay? For in such a space, there is not only would be no propagation of light, but also no possibility of existence of standards of space and time. So this is a very interesting point, which Einstein himself remarks in 1922, the requirement of this concept called ether as a medium for describing the vacuum state, vacuum state of space time, because space time is also dynamical and it has a vacuum state. But this ether may not be thought of as endowed with quality characteristic of ponderable media. We should not think that it is made up of ponderable media and consisting of parts which may be tracked through time. The idea of motion may not be applied to it. So in 1951, Dirac in Nature argued, is there an ether? He answered, we can now see that we may very well have an ether subject to quantum mechanics and confront conforming to relativity, provided we are willing to consider vacuum as idealized state not attainable in practice. That vacuum of space-time, which you have conventional, is 
is not attainable. The real vacuum is a quantum vacuum. From experimental point of view, there does not seem to be any objection to this. We must not make profound alterations to the idea of vacuum. This is what Dirac says. John Bell suggests ether was wrongly rejected on purely philosophical grounds. What is unobservable does not exist. The last one I'm going to quote is Laughlin. The word ether has an extremely negative connotation in theoretical physics because of its association with opposition to relativity. Unfortunate because stripped of these connotations, it nicely captures the way most physicists think about vacuum. The modern concept of vacuum of space, confirmed every day by experiment, is relativistic ether. But we don't call it because this is taboo. Okay, this is what the quotation by Lockheed. So this is the picture of Dirac along with uh, Bose, which is there. The viscous drag effect of ether would still pose a problem because if there is ether of this vacuum, which is there, then it will create some problem because it will drag the uh, the loss, light has to go through that, your matter should go through that, etc. But we just now mentioned if our ether is made up of these dark photons, whatever you call it, then there is no problem because it doesn't interact. Like neutrinos don't interact with the earth itself, it goes through it. So there is no problem about this thing. These things will disappear if you take them to be superfluid. It is a fluid with superfluid properties. <coughs> Such an idea was given by ECG Sudarshan in 1976. K.P. Sinha, Sivaram, and Sudarshan in Foundations of Physics proposed <coughs> a new model for ether as superfluid uh, of fermion-antifermion pairs, but this is only speculative. <coughs> Nothing much is achieved out of this. Sorry. Okay. Pervading the entire universe may account for missing matter. This is a very interesting thing that missing matter idea, dark matter and dark energy. Dark energy was not known at that time. Dark matter was known and uh, dark matter he wanted to accommodate by this thing was an interesting proposal by George Sugashi. Well, this is a lighter wheel. I will skip this. Now I'm going to, uh, after reversing the gear, I ask the question. Now we have the fantastic black body radiation, which is given by cosmic microwave background. Now I can ask the question, how much cosmic microwave background will be changed if photon has a mass? Okay. Now what can do the calculations again and uh, we can put limits on the mass of the photon from the deviation from black body spectrum for the CMB, cosmic microwave background. So this is the formula. The formula is EQ by e to, e to the power E by KT minus one into square root of one minus E square by M square by E square due to modified dispersion relation. The dispersion relation is P square is equal to E square minus M square or P square plus M square is equal to E square. Such an analysis was done by Julian Heck in Prisoner of Letters in 2013. And he estimated the difference between the spectrum which you get from here, density, and the cosmic microwave background. And that gave a mass of the photon should be less than 10 power minus six electron volt. So whatever mass you assume, as long as it is less than 10 power minus six, it will agree with the cosmic microwave background and it will not produce any change in the result. So this is the thing. Now he did a very interesting thing. If photon has a mass, can it decay is a question. Okay, if it has a mass, it can, can it decay is a question. Now if it can decay, it should can decay to a lesser mass particle. So there are three neutrinos and probably one of them, you can even assume it to be less than that. And there is no justification for this. And he assumed, basing, based on this, the found out the lifetime of uh, photon to be 10 to the power uh, with the m gamma is 10 power minus 18 electron volt. It is three years. The photon will decay in three years. This is what he found out.
Now we know our edge of the universe is 10 power 14 years. So definitely it is not agreeing. So what is happening? The interesting thing is the time dilation comes and helps. Since the photon travels with almost universal speed of time, which is the light velocity, 3 to 10 power 6, uh, uh, 10 power 5 kilometers per second, you, there is a huge time dilation. So you can wipe. So this three years is in its rest frame. In the frame in which it is traveling, you can find out the speed at which it will decay. And that turns out to be 10 to the power 18 years. And it is 10 power 4, 10,000 times more than that of the age of the universe. So there is no problem. It will not decay if you assume that this is the interesting. But the assumptions in this thing are questionable is what is that. Now I can produce a standard model with Stuckelberg field, which I have written down in equation 22. We have a weinberg salam model, which is given by B mu nu, B mu nu is for the SU2 part. F mu nu, F mu nu is for the U1 part. And there is a mass term, which is introduced by the Stuckelberg theory. And there is a potential for the scalar field, which is also some complex scalar field, a doublet, which is also 23. So this is the theory. And we can try to work out in this model, which I have not done, which I'm trying to do, various calculation. Now I'm going to wind up by saying some more uh, developments which have taken place. Net effect is mass of the photon is small, small corrections to mass, Z boson and Weinberg angle, which you cannot experimentally verify. And uh, there is a proposal by Dwali et al that holography can be formulated in terms of information capacity. The Stuckelberg field degrees of freedom lives on the boundary of the, because they are long wavelength. So they essentially stay at the boundary and the degrees of freedom of the Stuckelberg field will account for the information capacity and account for the holography. These degrees of freedom as qubits encode quantum information and the capacity is controlled by inverse of Stuckelberg energy gap. And this is also some work which was done by Dwali et al. They relate to the scaling of the gap or the boundary of Stuckelberg edge modes and Bogolibov modes. So there are a lot of work to be done. And uh, infrared question, there is no problem because there is no infrared problem. You can ask the question, can I go from U1 theory to SU M theory? Answer is there are a lot of problems in Stuckelberg generalization to non-abelian theories. And what about gravity? Should graviton be massive? Answer is yes, it can be massive and mass can be very tiny. And there are a lot of massive gravity theories people have been working out and it can probably provide some answer to uh, gravity, uh, dark energy, okay? And uh, I want to quote with the remark of Riemann infinitesimal and infinite axioms underlying the basis of geometry. They are very profound and we have to understand them at that level. I'm going to acknowledge my and references. The people who are in different parts are Ramadevi, Jai More, Rakesh Tibrewala, Dikil Kalyanapuram. And I have a lot of discussions with Ravindran, Bala, A.P. Balachandran, Kalyan Rama. And we have published with Nikhil was a student. Now he, they, after being, he was an undergraduate student. He went to perimeter. And, and uh, this is some work which we did with infrared problems and also with respect to ultralight dark matter. And there's some work with the Ramadevi, Jayit More, etc., on uh, massless limit of this theory. And recently, a lot of one more work has been done by Radhika Vinci, myself, Anuradha Mishra, Ramadevi, which is about supersymmetric generalization of Stuckelberg theory. And there are some more work which is going on with Rakesh Tibrevala and also Surya Das. And I'll stop here. So this is what I have to say. Uh, I have taken nearly one and a half hours. Hopefully that will be sufficient. Is that okay? Hello? Hello? Yeah. Yes? Yes. Yeah. So, so I have come. 
yeah so uh, i know, i know nikhil because i told you that i have met him at perimeter oh yeah sure you met nikhil is it yes yes oh he's a nice guy he is a very good very br- interesting student yeah yeah right now i saw that he actually independently working on many problems it's very good actually yeah yeah he is, he is a very clever guy intelligent yeah. guy it's it's very good actually and uh, okay thanks uh, trg for giving uh, such a nice contribution and uh, i am hopeful that all the students are benefited out of that we also have learned a lot of thing um so i just have something because like i told you before that like the similar kind of mechanism people can have able to study for graviton as, as well massive graviton sure. in fact that's what i wanted to work with you yes so i'll come to uh, nicer sometime we'll do it please come and uh, that's a very interesting problem i want to basically so you actually have suggested me a paper no no you you have given me a reference and uh, on this gravity side could you please able to send me that reference yes. if you don't mind again yeah i will do it i will do it i'll send by email please do that that will make it easier yes okay i'll give so, you the link is there is any question by kiran and rohan Mm, yes sir i have a question regarding the massive gravity please please so, okay in the, uh, in the lego experiment uh, they they found that the speed of a graviton it's uh, equal to the almost equal to the speed of light i mean so yeah. doesn't yeah. it uh, already uh, say that no. graviton is uh, be massive I, i consulted all the lego people uh, at least to the extent i know uh, the small difference so you can ask your question what is the mass is there a mass difference between photon and graviton that kind of question you can ask experimentally operationally that's the question you will ask that difference we are not, uh, the speeds with which we have because the particles travel over a large distance uh, of the order of millions of uh, light years away millions of light years away so you cannot uh, conclude from there that they have the same mass but they are the same uh, the the what we can say is the speed of both graviton and thing to the ex- extent we can measure they are the same speed they are the same speed that's what is it but there are a lot of effects in between the source of the uh, source of the merger and uh, as seen on earth because the two particles one is photon and graviton uh, they have different effects okay they have different effects in in the medium which is there and uh, that has to be taken into account and uh, people have not done that kind of thing and this whatever difference they find you cannot easily uh, finding this difference is very extremely tiny for example if photon has a mass of 10 to the minus 22 electron volt and graviton has a mass of 10 to the minus 30 electron volts take it as a trivial numbers the difference which you have will be so tiny that it will not show up in the uh, experiment of ligo as of now within this thing as of now within the scheme which is there uh, the tiny difference of it will produce probably few seconds or something like that and our uh, experiments are not sufficient to measure that kind of difference so that is the current status uh, yes thank you so does the ligo experiment create a bound on the mass of the gravitons or no we, the mass of the graviton there is no uh, bound on that we don't know in fact the current bound is uh, it is less than the book the particle data book gives it is less than 10 to the power minus 33 electron volt that is because gravity exists till the edge of the universe but uh, this kind of thing is uh, there is no uh, rigid way in which we can measure, measure it we can uh, give this as a limit but photon due to magnetic field we can give the limits but we don't have such a uh, handle on the gravity side 
So, uh, Rohan, do you have any question? Uh, yes, sir. So, sir, I wanted to ask, sir, uh, like what kind of experiment can be carried out to check if the Stuckelberg, if the if dark matter consists of Stuckelberg particles? Okay. So, this is the question. So, this is the for dark matter to be Stuckelberg particles, then uh, the only way uh, the dark matter is there is by the bose einstein condensate. So it exists as a fluid, as a wave, throughout the, say, galactic scales of the dwarf galaxies. So what we can, people have done only uh, cosmological kind of experiments. So all those things are agreeing, with the lensing, et cetera, agreeing. And uh, that seems to be good agreement for the uh, mass profile, mass profile of the dark matter inside dark, dwarf galaxies, yeah, galaxies whose sizes are something like thousand parsecs, smaller part thing. They have only one million stars. Whereas uh, Milky Way has something like uh, uh, million billion stars, million billion stars. So this is a kind of a problem and uh, in these things, a lot of uh, speculative things are there which are going on. And it can be ultra light particle like axion, but the only question is what is the mass of axion, whether it has any effect in the particle physics seem to be very little. So any, uh, whatever experiment which we want to verify, most probably it is only cosmological side. And, uh, they essentially fitting the data with various expectations which are there in uh, the uh, data about several, several galaxies. So this is the thing, but if there is a very intelligent uh, experiment because it is completely entangled because the Bose-Einstein condensate is a highly entangled quantum state. So if there is a nice way of, if I disturb that uh, thing, then there will be a wave which is going to spread and that will have some effect and uh, people can uh, talk about some of those things. And I don't, I'm trying to understand some. I don't have a complete understanding. I'm trying to understand whether there is some uh, effect which can be given even on cosmic scale, which will be of interest. That is the current state. Oh, okay, sir. Thank you. You can re refer to that review, uh, the ar article which I mentioned, that asterisk, uh, in, then this will be available to, I will send this to uh, the QAS uh, file that, the, my PDF file, and if it is recorded, it will be there. Uh, you can see the paper, and there are several references of the review on ultralight dark matter, which is there already. Oh, it is, it, it, uh, it is recorded. It is recorded and it will be posted in YouTube. Okay. So okay. you don't need to send the separately the PDF file. Okay. So okay, why I'm saying do that. like, uh, uh, yeah, but for particular case, I can, uh, it's okay. But like, uh, it's better to see from the top because you have explained everything in detail. Okay. Thank you. And uh, thank you very much for this contribution and stay safe and healthy. And uh, hopefully we can thank see you. each other very soon. Yeah. Sure. So because yeah. we last met at 2019 and then all this yes. stuff happened and we couldn't able to meet. So maybe yes. you please write to Shudhakar because he's the person. Yeah. yeah. Uh, also, yeah, you if you write, now if you write, you, you can visit for what, how many months, it's not matter. Okay. Okay. And anyhow, Sudhagar is a good friend. He has always been telling me to come there. Tell my regards to him. Sure, sure. Okay. Sure. Best he's actually very he's busy, tell. so he, he couldn't able to attend the talk, but he's very busy actually. To, throughout the day, I heard that he was doing a lot of meetings regarding this COVID, is that a lot of all the administrative, administrative people have a lot of responsibilities now. Yeah. Okay. Anyhow.
Shall yeah. we close down? Yeah. Thank you. Bye. Okay. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.